Hello there and welcome to CNR Extra here on CCTV coming to you live from our studios at number 5 Ola Hansen Lane, Tessano, Accra. My name is Philip Nihilate. Coming up. Police arrest some four persons seen in a viral video attacking a police patrol team while accusing them of extorting money from them. But the prime suspect who is still on a run records himself in his hideout denying the facts as put out by the police in a press release. Stakeholders in the fishing industry react to former President John Dramani Mohamed's campaign promise to exclude Kenun and artisanal fishermen from the close season exercise. We have been worked through a lot of, you know, scientific reasons why we should manage the stocks. And as artisanal fishers, we have all come to a conclusion that indeed we must comply. I'm surprised this is coming up. But whatever it is, it is adding to the recovery of the stock. And patients seeking medical care at the Upper East Regional Hospital in Bogatanga demand immediate suspension of sanitation fees charged by the facility. It's just very annoying because we are not aware. You know, you bring your, 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 this, your child or your sick patient here, even the money is not even available. And you have to, first of all, you have to pay this amount before you can see doctor. I think it's not, it's not, it's not proper. But Chief Justice Kwesi in Yebu admonishes judicial service workers to resist from harassing and extorting monies from persons seeking justice at the various courts across the country. Harassment in all forms, including the threats and extortion of money from persons who come to the court for redress, is the cruelest way to treat our own people. I urge the public to stand firm and refuse to yield to the unlawful demands of judicial officers and staff. Once again, welcome to CNR Extra here on City TV. You can join us with your thoughts, submissions, and comments via WhatsApp line 0204-447033. We are streaming live on YouTube, and you can join us there on City Tube. Hansen Ajimanya, welcome to the show. It's a new week, a new month, and a new day. A blessed one. Uh, looking for the best. Uh, the month of April. Um, I mean, so soon. How was the weekend? My weekend was good. It was good. Uh, Looking forward to the Easter weekend as course, well, even though it's a Monday. Very, 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 very important. Let's bring you the very first story, and that has to do with uh, the police. And the police has arrested some four persons seen in a viral video attacking the police patrol team while accusing them of extorting money from them. Let's start off with a story that has been trending on social media and indeed on traditional media. Now, the Ghana Police Service arrested four persons belonging to a gang that allegedly attacked some police officers of the Axim Divisional Police Patrol Team on March 9, 2023. The gang members are reported to have manhandled the police personnel and seized the magazine of a service rifle together with some mobile phones during the attack. An intelligence operation launched by the police has resulted in the arrest of the four suspects after three weeks on the run. The four suspects include Kojo Sla, alias Mose, Emmanuel Mensah, alias Kofi Asamoah, Maxo Kujo, and Ajabu Haruna Desau. A statement by the Ghana Police Service on the arrest which occurred on March 28 disclosed the research conducted at the residence of Kwame Atua Sariani. The prime suspect, who is still on the run, led to the retrieval of three pump-action shotguns, one pump-action shotgun, two machetes, and eight BB eight BB rifle cartridges uh, were retrieved from the suspect's unregistered Honda CRV vehicle. Other items reti retrieved from the suspect include two live refilled 
BB cartridges and one unregistered motorbike. According to the police, the allegation of extortion against the officers has been referred to the Police Professional Standards Bureau, PFS, PPSP, for investigation. All the suspects in the reported attack on the patrol team who have been arrested have been put before the court and have since been remanded into police custody. Efforts are continuing to get the remaining suspects arrested. The alleged police attack and extortion in the Isma East Municipality of the Western Region, Kwame Atu Asareni, has released a video from his hideout stating that he is not a criminal as being perpetrated or stated by the police, but rather an informant of the service. Police phone say I attack him. I'm my man's sword. No chase I video now. No chase. You have to say I'm I'm my name in the year Juma. No chase I video now. Police phone say I attack him. No more count. No more patch on him. Police phone catch us. I'm my name in the year Juma. This is the beginning of my new adventure. So police don't know who I am. I'm too. I didn't know I catch us. I'm my name in the year Juma. Me and your police don't know who police are talking to. And so didn't know police were about Bush. Yeah, I'm a musica. Now if oh patch us, I'm only in the year Juma. They are all part of the Robin, Robin, because So Kwame Ato Asari Enin, who we just saw speaking in your short, has indicated that he is willing to speak the truth when it comes to this issue, but any form of attack on a police officer is not accepted. But then again, investigations has commenced into this particular issue. But I think um, from what he is saying, he is he's saying that he, he works directly with the police. And if anything at all, he is ready to tell exactly what happened in that bush. If he's ready to tell what is so he what happens, you just go to the police. I mean, it's <laughs> it's 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 very simple. There are allegations, and these are serious allegations Level for against him. for these persons to make because they've been arrested for their police for engaging in certain acts which include alleged robbery, and then they are counter accusing the police of working with them, and for that matter, giving them guns, even those guns that they use. But he's not telling us what job he and his colleagues do in connection with, with the police. police. Now, that is one area we are not clear. But they are saying that you are engaged in, in robbery. Mm -hmm. And then you're also saying that the police are engaged in extortion. Mm -hmm. On what level? I mean, these are very serious things to say. And you cannot let people assume your innocence by just making a video and saying that if anywhere they send a matter, I'm willing to um, come and make my case. When the police has, has actually come out, the police have actually come out to issue an arrest mm -hmm. uh, or a notice of, of you being wanted and you know your way to the police station. So, so for me, the, the, first, the first part is that if indeed he thinks that he's innocent and he has not done anything wrong. Your medium shouldn't be social media. Go to the police and sort it out. The second thing has to do with how the police will have to handle this. 
because this feeds into a certain narrative that exists already. I mean, how many times haven't you heard people raise suspicions of the police sometimes working in connection with armed robbers? How times haven't you heard people suspecting that some armed robbers have guns because police officers give them those guns? Mm. How many times haven't we seen news items of people being arrested holding guns and those guns linked to, to, the, some, police to some police officers? And so if we are to build a trust in the police institution, how we deal with this is very important. Mm. How we address this is key. I mean, aside the very reasons for which we've arrested uh, these gang members, we also have to look at the allegations against the police. And I don't think it should be an either-or situation. We shouldn't be looking at exonerating the police and then putting some people in jail. Or it shouldn't be that these people have to go to jail and then the police will be free or the police will be dealt with and these people will be free. We should look at it holistically and address the issue. And if indeed these are allegations, frivolous allegations that they are making against the police, aside whatever they've done, they should be dealt with appropriately because you are smearing the image of the Ghana Police Service, the single most important institution that maintains order in society. Now, we know on the part of the allegations against the police, the Police Professional Standard Bureau has been uh, given the directive to investigate. I mean, when we talk about the Police uh, Professional Standard Bureau, a lot of people have their own uh, views about them, on, that on, uh, on that institution and as to whether it actually carries out uh, professional and independent impartial work when it comes to investigating one of their own. I mean, we can make the argument that we need an independent body aside the police to be a check on them. But at this point in time, I don't think that that argument will be one that will resolve the situation that we are in. So this can only be a charge to the, uh, the General Police Professional Standards Bureau that this is an opportunity to, if indeed the existence of that institution is still relevant and is able to do things impartially, to go through the entire process and let's see if their officers did anything wrong. wrong. And let's establish that perhaps this is a single incident and do not affect the entire police. And I'm hitting on this because we don't want a situation where the confidence that people have in the police will dwindle more. With these accusations, what, if you make these accusations fly, what you're telling the Ghanaian is that even the armed robber that you are afraid of, a police officer who you should call to come and rescue you is supporting that person. And over the past years, we've seen how violent crimes have increased. The small arms commission at some point in time have complained about the, the proliferation of, of arms, arms in the system and to a large extent cannot even account for how some people get to hold mm. certain arms. Mm. I mean, we don't want to get to the, mm. the, 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 the likes of America mm -hmm. where gun violence <laughs> is uncontrollable. <laughs> okay. And how best we handle some of these mm. issues will tell how well we, we solve the matter entirely. Exactly. So the investigations have to go down well, and everybody involved in this issue, uh, well, have to be unraveled so that we'll see whether it's the gang men who are speaking the truth or the police officers are also saying their side of the story. I went from this story, and the Chief Justice Kwesi Enenyebua is admonishing judicial service workers to desist from harassing and extorting money from persons seeking justice. Staff have been admonished to desist from extorting money from court clients and also harassing persons seeking justice from the judiciary. 
They've also been charged to work diligently and also exhibit high levels of professionalism in the discharge of their duties to engineer confidence in the courts. Chief Justice Eninyebua gave the advice when he commissioned a new high court complex in Kaswa in the central region. Our correspondent there is Calvis Tete. The newly constructed Kaswa High Court, located at Opako in the Uchi Senya East Municipality of the Central Region, is expected to save court clients from long distance travels either to Aguna Suedru or Winneba to access court services. Clients were mostly confronted with huge transport costs and the inconvenience of long travels, a situation that mostly demotivates them from using the court as a means of settlement. Commissioning the Kaswa High Court which has come to add up to the already existing district and magistrate courts in the enclave, Justice Kwesi Enin Yaboa, the Chief Justice of Ghana, emphasized the need for befitting courthouses and expressed optimism that the new project will help in uploading work on the Winneba and Swedro High Courts and ensure fast delivery of justice. He announced that the Kaswa District Court will later this year be retooled to serve as a child-friendly gender-based court to handle domestic violence cases, which is on the rise, in the enclave. The Chief Justice, however, admonished court staff to be diligent and professional in the discharge of their duties. He described as cruel all acts of harassment, threats, and extortion of money from court clients. Justice Enim Yabua, however, encouraged the public to stand firm and refuse to yield to unlawful demands from judicial service staff. He further encouraged the public to report such conduct for perpetrators to be dealt with by the Judicial Council. Urge court users and the bar to fully patronize the court connected alternative dispute resolution services, in respect of which mediators are trained and attached to the courts from time to time. As compared to formal litigation or courtroom trials, the alternative dispute resolution has proven to be speedier, cheaper, and less aggressive than adversarial. Arguably, a new a newly constructed courthouse will not be of much use if the administrative staff do not effectively assist the judge to function productively. To this end, I urge the staff in this court to exhibit a high sense of professionalism in the discharge of their duties. I would like to remind them that most clients who patronize our service are often physically and emotionally distressed. They need comfort and help as they turn to the courts for justice. Harassment in all forms including the threats and extortion of money from persons who come to the court for redress is the cruelest way to treat our own people. I urge the public to stand firm and refuse to yield to the unlawful demands of judicial officers and staff. Do not be afraid to report such people for appropriate disciplinary action to be taken against them. I can assure you that the Judicial Council, which I chair, will not shield any judicial officer or staff found to have been guilty of misconduct. It is my hope that this court will present a new and friendlier face of justice delivery in this municipality. On her part, Anita Law Oboemisa, a Utu Senior East MCE, while underscoring the vital need for conflict resolution, expressed belief that the court would help cater for the judicial needs of residents of the area. She says the assembly is inspired by the local government act which mandates them to provide ready access to courts for the promotion of justice. Research has it that increasing population can lead to conflict, particularly when combined with resource scarcity, and more so when the municipality has limited capacity to manage the needs of its people. Conflict resolution and human rights are inseparable when it comes to the well-being of human communities. Crimes, conflict, and misunderstanding exist among humans everywhere and are inevitable. Section 2, subsection 3B of the Local Governance Act 2016, Act 936, as amended mandates, district assemblies to ensure ready access to court in the district for the promotion of justice. A very important message coming from the Chief Justice, and he says that, well, don't yield to these things if you are seeking for legal redress or some legal uh, justice in the courts, because uh, the judicial service workers are not supposed to extort any money 
or they are not supposed to harass individuals coming in. I think it's a very important one because everybody, in one way or the other, you would want to seek for justice in a particular case that maybe is bothering you. It has to be maybe land, it has to be uh, issues about divorce, issues, anything at all. The person would want to go to the, the court to seek some justice. There's, there's, there's one thing that we need to understand here, that if you look at how the justice system works, I mean, from the superior courts, mm. uh, that's the, from your Supreme Court, your Court of Appeal, your High Court, and then to your lower courts, district courts, I mean, how efficient they run is judiciary. Usually, those we know are the judges, and then to an extent, the lawyers who are officers of the court. But there are a number of uh, workers who operate to make sure that everything that you would do in making sure that you get justice w uh, becomes possible. Mm. Now, if you look at how our justice system is, the substance of your case is equally important as the procedure. Mm -hmm. So you see, a senior lawyer will go to court and an entire case will be crushed because he missed a procedure. Now, going through this procedure appropriately is to take it through the staff of the judicial service who will help you go through the procedure. Procedure and, successfully. Yes, and sometimes <laughs> you will speak to the lawyers mm -hmm. because the judicial service staff, they've been there for a number of years, for some decades. They understand the procedure just like that. It's, it's like you come to work, you know, I move from here, I go here. Mm -hmm. So they understand it. And then there are sometimes, you know, egos come to play. So even sometimes the staff will have to explain the procedure better to the lawyer. Mm -hmm. For the lawyer to understand how he should go about things. About things so that his or her case will not be thrown out just for the sake of procedure. Now, that tells you how important they are. And if I've created the scenario that even lawyers who have gone through LLB, gone to Makola, have been called, to done their people, at a point in time, will have to depend on the knowledge of the judicial service. Then it tells you how more the ordinary guardian who will be going there for certain uh, actions will need the judicial service more the staff of the judicial service more. And so, in, in an unregulated mm -hmm. or unmonitored and unchecked environment, if you leave these people alone with that level of knowledge power, it could lead to extortion. But one may ask that I want a case done very fast. Mm -hmm. I want the procedures done very well. And I may have to, in a way, grease someone's palm to get things done very fast. What is going to be put in place? What are the checks and balances to ensure that I don't face that particular challenge by not halting the process, halting at a point? Because I didn't grease someone's palm. I didn't give the person whatever he or she deserves for the person to now move the procedure from one stage to the other. Well, I mean, this is a, it's a bigger conversation from the judiciary. Mm. I mean... You've heard of these issues when you go to the passport office, you go to the birth and death registry, you go to the DVLA, that they are guru boys mm -hmm. in a way that if you want to do certain things. So I cannot sit here and say that such uh, blocks do not exist in the judiciary where some people have made it their own job to benefit from the system. But what I can say is that the call by the Chief Justice is essential to make sure that because the judicial service staff have their own code of ethics that they have to go in line with. And the very first point about the code of office Just a brief one, is yeah. abuse of position. Mm. And the abuse of position highlights a number of things including extortion mm -hmm. and even taking gifts to influence how you do things. But all I'm saying is that this call is very essential. Very. And also to the registrars of the various courts and even to the chief justice, the system should be streamlined in such a way that you can indeed actually uh, prevent some of these extortions. Because if you make it go that way, then it will 
affect and hinder justice delivery? Well, very important. And even the Chief Justice made mention of the fact that, well, if you are uh, seeking for justice and this is what is happening, you are at liberty to report to the powers that be. Away from that story, and patients seeking medical health uh, to the Upper East Regional Hospital are demanding immediate suspension of sanitation fees charged by the hospital. Move to the Upper East Regional, where patients seeking medical care at the Upper East Regional Hospital in Bolga are demanding the immediate suspension of sanitation fees charged by the hospital before allowing them to see a doctor for diagnosis. Patients say the move by the hospital impedes access to health care, especially for the poor and needy. The Upper East Regional Hospital in the past days has been demanding of patients to pay sanitation fee as part of payments when one is seeking medical attention. According to management of the hospital, the sanitation levy on patients is as a result of delays by the National Health Insurance Scheme in reimbursing the facility to enable efficient operations. But patients who had come to access health care at the facility described the sanitation fee being charged as illegal and an attempt to extort monies from them. Some patients alleged that the hospital demanded of every patient to pay 10 Ghana cedis and 20 Ghana cedis respectively for outpatients and inpatient services as sanitation levy before being processed to see a doctor. Speaking to City News, some patients said the levy imposed on them is an impediment to quality health care delivery and thus called for an immediate suspension. It's just very annoying because we are not aware. You know, you bring your, 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 this, your child or your sick patient here, even the money is not even available and you have to First of all, you have to pay this amount before you can see doctor. I think it's not it's not it's not proper. How much were you made to pay? You know, well, they, they are saying that children who are under five years don't pay anything. You just need to uh, send your card and they will clear you. But those that are above five years, you pay ten cities. Now, if if they suspend, it will be good for us. But we don't have any power. Once you bring your, your, your patient, whatever they say, you need to follow. If you don't follow, they will not treat you, so you don't have anything to say. My, my health insurance card, my child health insurance card to the record. Then the records just said I have to pay 10 CD. I said, ah, but I have health insurance. That is composed with sanitation fee. I said, no, I'm not aware on it. That, yes, it's composed that I have to pay. I said, no, I, won't, I don't have 10 CD. That, no, if I don't have 10 CD, then they can't process me for doctor to check on me and as I, the child was not well I have to pay composite so I was not happy about what they just said sanitation fee what what is it about I don't I'm not happy and I'm not aware of the sanitation fee they should scrap it at all they should scrap it because we don't know they should negotiate the government with the government so that the government knows how to uh, put the sanitation fee inside but the medical director of the Upper East Regional Hospital, Dr. Aiden Santa Senwier, says the sanitation levy was not compulsory for patients to pay before accessing health care, but rather patients are encouraged to pay the levy. He added that no doctor has the right to turn away patients because they haven't paid the sanitation fee. While some disgruntled patients are calling for the immediate suspension of the sanitation fee of 10 and 20 Ghana cities respectively for outpatients and inpatients, management of the hospital says the sanitation fee is not compulsory. However, patients are encouraged to pay these fees to enable the facility run smoothly. Reporting from the Upper East Regional Hospital, I am Frederick Awuni, Bogatanga. Sanitation fee. But sanitation, I think, is supposed to be the uh, responsibility of government for this to be, for the facility to be clean every now and then, and that shouldn't come from patients. Well, um, I, I cannot give 
um, an exhaustive answer <laughs> for yes or no. Um, but of course, um, certainly, mm -hmm. if any institution can take certain fees, that fees will have to be sanctioned. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, to a large extent, get approval. I mean, from the explanation that Latif got from the medical superintendent, it's clear that this is not a fee that is mandatory in exactly, itself. Exactly, because even the management of the organization is saying that it's not compulsory, it's optional. You choose to pay or not to yes. pay. But I think that if the various authorities are able to give a concrete definition to this thing, that will help. So that any patient who moves into the facility knows that, okay, fine, I'm supposed to pay the sanitation fee and not have issues that until I pay and don't have access to health care. This, this, yeah. this, this isn't right. So anyway, you're still watching CNR Extra here on the City TV, still to come. Stakeholders in the fishing industry react to former President John Dramani Mohammed's campaign promise to exclude canoe and artisanal fishermen from the close season exercise. Stay with us, we'll be back with more stories. and buy your tickets now. Tickets are also available at Airport Shell, Bachelor Total, Sunny 88.7 FM and All Harvest Chapel branches in Accra. Children are not left out. Children from ages 5 to 12 will enjoy an awesome experience at the HP Kids session featuring King's Kid, Louis Pascal, Kata Harry and many more. Entry is free for kids once you purchase an adult ticket. Come let's celebrate. It's the Silver Jubilee. Have us praise. Get your praise on. <laughs> See you there. Welcome back. This is CNR Extra here on CCTV. You can join us with your thoughts, submissions, and comments via WhatsApp line 0204-70433. And uh, this is what we've been discussing so far on uh, the show from uh, the Upper East region. We've been half, half stories on the Ghana Police Service and also from the Judicial Service. Let's now take you to the Ashanti region where government and various agencies have been urged to involve Ghanaian professionals in uh, the award of contracts such as the new Kijitia market. The government and various agencies have been urged to involve Ghanaian professionals in the award of contracts such as the new Kijitia market. This comes after fire and gob the facility destroying items running into millions of CDs. According to an architect, Dennis Kwame Domfe, who is also a lecturer at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, involving Ghanaian professionals with a better knowledge of the topics could, be developed, could help develop facilities that can better withstand various 
challenges such as the recent fire at Kejetia. There's more in this report by City News' Bureau Chief for the Middle Belt, Edward Okomafo. Victims of the recent New Kejetia market fire are yet to get over the incident. So far, the government has set up a five-member committee to look into the fire outbreak. It is not clear when a reconstruction of the affected parts would be done. This has caused anxiety among the affected traders who say their source of livelihood has virtually been cut off while this incident has gotten a public commenting, an architecture lecturer at KNUSD, Dennis Kwame Dunfe, believes this could have been avoided if more local professionals had been involved in the construction of the project. According to him, Ghanaian architects, for instance, are familiar with the tropics and the culture of the people and would have come up with a structure that would best fit the lifestyle of Ghanaians and address all other safety concerns. I've not done... Um a comprehensive analysis on the project. But when you look at the design, looking at our tropics, there are a few questions which come up with such a design. I think that the authorities are probably doing their best. But what we as um, professionals want to advise is that we need more involvement. There has to be more involvement of Ghanaian professionals. Because every building is put into a, a particular climatic zone. And depending upon the climatic zone, it informs the kind of designs that you need to come up with. Even our culture is something to consider. Our way of selling is something to consider. So when you build a market like that, you know that we like selling on, on, on the ground or we do a lot of impulse buying. You and I buy a lot of impulse. That's why we cannot send hawkers away because we do a lot of impulse buying. So can we come up with innovative plans such that even as we design our roads, can we have innovative stores for people where, for example, if you visit Oxford Street in London, okay, on certain days on the weekend, major roads are closed and it's a market. On certain days it's opened and it's accepted. Can we involve our professionals more so that when we come up with such designs, it is more climatic specific Okay, so that when such things happen, they can be mitigated. Can we train our people a bit more? He also wants the committee probing the incident to come up with findings that will best address the identified challenges. The committee will do a lot more in-depth analysis, exactly what started the fire and all of that. But we heard that it was at an area where there was carbide, there was a bit of um, turpentine, a number of things. So these are very inflammable materials, obviously. So maybe they, they, a lot more should have been done. I will not want to preempt the committee. I know they will do, uh, there are a lot of astute people, obviously, on the committee. They will do a bit more. But I think that moving forward, these are some of the things that we need to look at. When we have a design which is done, everything begins with a design. Before it's built, I tell my clients it's easier to change on paper than to change on site. Let's make all the changes on paper before we build. For City News, I'm Edward upon Marvel, New Kijitia Markets, Kumasi. And it's very important how individuals in the country, i.e. engineers, can be involved in the building of a lot of projects in this country. There are a lot of fine brains in this country. So if you are putting up an infrastructure that is going to house 9,000 people and they are going to have people there to shop and all that, the safety measures, all what is entails to be put inside that particular building, must be done. But I don't think that a new KDTR market was built without uh, having fine, fine brains. But maybe going forward, that can also be considered as well. Yes, and I think that the, the bigger issue has to do with is whether um, locals involved or not, they're trying as much as possible to understand how the project will fit into the lifestyle of the people. I mean, the new KJTL market is one of the biggest infrastructure projects you have in the, in the, in the country. And, but if you go around the issues of traffic congestion mm -hmm. still existed, and people who came to the market had to park at certain places. A number of, of, of issues that had even been, been raised prior to this fire incident. I mean, this is not in any way to suggest that the people who 
constructed the new KJT market did anything untold. I mean, even the experts who spoke there mm -hmm. noted that they did their best, and he's using using this as a basis to admonish government on how to plan going forward. And I, I, it's good that we have a committee made up of persons from different fields looking into what happened and generally looking into the new KGT market going forward. We can only wait for the findings of these people and know what exactly can be done to make the new KGT market lead to uh, reasons for which it was constructed. Exactly. So it's important that after every structure has been put on or has been a, uh, constructed, there should be some sort of maintenance, maybe the maintenance culture or all that. And even the uh, newly inaugurated president of the Ghana Institution of Engineering, Engineer Kwabana Bimpon, has also asked that, well, engineering practitioners in the country should as well help um, solve engineering problems in this country. Away from that, and let's bring you that story uh, that is from uh, the fishing community where President, uh, former President John Dramani Mahama has stated that he's going to exclude canoe and artisanal fisher folk uh, in the close season exercise. There's a reaction to that from the fishing community. Let's bring you that insight about fish now and stakeholders in the fishing industry have expressed mixed reactions over former president Mahama's promise to exclude canoe and artisanal fishermen from the close season if he becomes president according to mr Mahama, the activities of the groups of fishermen do not play a role in the issue of dwindling fish stock in the country he said close season will be for only trawlers but as some fisher folk believe the move is a step in the right direction, others think otherwise. There's more in this report by City News' Philip Ni Lati. Close season, no. You be close to my fishing trawlers, I can see, no. Canoe fishermen, ne artisanal fishermen. Ah, umu yusu here, ma. Any small canoes, it will not be closed for them. That was former President John Raman Mahama when he spoke to some delegate in fancy man in the central region where he indicated that the artisanal and canoe fisher folk will be exempted from close season exercise under his administration. We will explore the thoughts of uh, John Dramani Mahama. You speak to the stakeholders in the industry, what they make of this decision, whether uh, the artisanal and canoe fisher folk should be halted uh, or should be exempted from the exercise and that of the trawlers should be the only group that will participate in the close season exercise. We have, have to exempt from, yes, he has to exempt us from this closing season. The government has to do something about that. We've been talking about it for a long time. So if he's, he's there to talk about it, it means he's telling the, the Why truth. Why should he be exempted? Uh, because uh, it's not wealthy. It's not wealthy because you can't rob Peter to pay for. Meanwhile, you hold his still hold. You can't be feeding us with rice. Meanwhile, you have closed down the people. They are not sick. They are not doing anything. You just sit down. You feed them. After that, some will go for stealing. Some will be hungry. Some will die. And then you close the this thing for unnecessary. Open it to become a, something like a fish that you are expecting. You don't get it well. And the, the actual problem is the fishing trolleys. Lightning fishermen are going... The lighting vision still, nothing at all has been done about it. Even the toilets, for now, we have seen that there's a slight change over there. But the lighting fishermen are still continuing doing their lighting activities. And still, nothing at all has been changed shows that due to the closing season, something has changed or something has occurred. Meanwhile, the Ghana National Canoe Fishermen Council says no group should be excluded from the exercise. According to the acting president of the Ghana National Canoe Fishermen Council, Nana Jojo Solomon, the move will help address the issue of dwindling fish stock. What we've got to do with our stocks is about management, managing the resource. We have over, over capacity there as artisanal fishers. We are doing almost 15,000 canoes as against 9,000 which, according to research or science, should be the uh, number of canoes that will sustain the fishery. And therefore, for me, we, we, have, we, have, they, we have been walked through a lot of 
you know, scientific reasons why we should manage the stocks. And as artisanal fishers, we have all come to a conclusion that indeed we must comply. I'm surprised this is coming up. But whatever it is, it is adding to the recovery of the stocks. So, and we cannot blame the industrial trawlers alone because we are also a part. We are doing light fishing, we are doing some undersized meshes, we are doing dynamite chemical fishing, we are doing so many things that are untoward and that has contributed to the collapse. We cannot blame just one sector of the you know, industry. Though some artisanal fishermen are excited about the decision and want government to implement it by exempting them from the close season exercise, the Ghana Canoe Fishermen Council is of the view that the exercise should include all fishing groups in the industry. The Industrial Trawlers Association has also yet to comment on this issue. Reporting for City News, my name is Philip Ni Latte. Close season exercises are the yearly um, exercises done annually uh, to ensure that the dwindling fish stock in the country is addressed well the artisanal and canoe fishermen have been complaining for some time i'm sure from the time the close season exercise was introduced they've been talking about how they feed how they survive during the one month period um, sometimes when you visit the the, the the seaside and have engagement with them you tend them to ask you are you able to stop your work for a month without doing anything and what comes out of it and we go back to the uh, to, for, for fishing expedition and we don't actually get anything but it looks like there is a mixed reaction in this one um, Nana Jojo Solomon who is with the council the Ghana National Canoe Fishermen Council is like no every set everybody in the field is contributing to the issue of the dwindling fish stock and that has to be resolved by all well I, I think that we need to look at it carefully mm. and I mean Ghana generally um, the fisher folk generally have been recording uh, dwindling uh, harvest levels uh, for a number of years now and even when we run a system of subsidized premix for what this means is that anybody who is fishing mm. in Ghana I mean until just recently that the subsidy had been taken off for a very long time these people were not operating at their full cost of production government was taking part of the cost of production yet still there were challenges with the fish stock that they will get mm. and how much they able to sell now the problem is very simple that's overfishing that means that there are not too many fishes to be caught and the close season is one of the ways to make sure that there's abundant fish mm -hmm. uh, for uh, fishing activities. I think that we need to look at it carefully. And just to end this comment is that stakeholders within the space have noted that close season is not the only way. And in that same level, I want to say that exempting some of the people from the close season is not an answer to the mm -hmm. issue. The answer to the issue is that we are instituting a close season and then we still have issues such as uh, fisher folk using small nets, more, uh, which is smaller than what is required. You have some uh, light fishing still ongoing. You also have issues of the use of poison and dynamite. And so if we don't have a coordinated effort, no matter how we implement the close season, it will still not work. It will still not work. And these answers have been there. Before close season started in 2018, mm. you said, and then Ghana had done a, a policy document mm -hmm. on close season. And the conclusion was that for close season to work, all the other illegal things that happened has to be stopped. Have to stop. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, if, if the former president, uh, hoping to look into this. I mean, there's, there was a national uh, fisheries management policy that was implemented during his time, which gives a more coordinated effort 
in looking at this. Exactly. So that is termed as the IUU, of the illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing that has to be dealt with alongside maybe implementing the closes and exercise. But of course, for a stakeholder, broad stakeholder engagement. You are watching CNR Extra here on City TV. Still to come. Ghanaian shoemaker expresses frustration over unfavorable business environment. Stay with us, we'll be back with that story. Evangelistic ministry. Consider me because me, who comes at you? People like us here, we make a dead screen. What can happen in 20 minutes? A play can be prepared in 20 minutes. Children can be conceived in 20 minutes. Guys, I hear that. This is the possession. Welcome back. Let's bring you this story where a Ghanaian shoemaker is expressing frustration of our unfavorable business environment. Ghanaian graduates often get accused of being lazy. They are repeatedly told to start their own businesses instead of feeling entitled to land in a job. Entrepreneurship is a buzzword trumpeted in the ears of young graduates with political actors promising to create the necessary environment for the young graduates to thrive. But what is the reality on the ground for young graduates who decide to start their own businesses? Caleb Kuda has been exploring that story. I would be biased towards female entrepreneurs in this report. Don't be offended. After all, U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris during her visit here last week campaigned for women entrepreneurs. Women are entrepreneurs, yet have limited access to capital and markets. And there are many factors that impact a woman's ability to survive and thrive. One of those is economic empowerment. And when we lift up the economic status of a woman, let's be clear, we lift up the economic status of her children, her family, her community, the entire economy benefits. So now, Meet my case study for female graduate startup owners. So my name is Akusia Sichajukum. I'm a chemical engineer by training. Um, I went to Holy Child, the general science. Then I moved to KNUST to do chemical engineering. Akusia is one of 90% of Ghanaian graduates who struggle to get employment after national service as shown by research. I had the opportunity to work, um, to do my national service at Ghana National Petroleum Corporation. Um, so I was trained as a petroleum engineer. I had the opportunity to work offshore the FPS just for a while, and then I branched into shoemaking. I tried to get a job, but actually searching for a job in this country is a full-time job. I gave up after a while, and then just decided to concentrate on learning the skill, the, the shoemaking skill. I met her while she worked on some products for her clients. If I hadn't seen her make them, I would have thought these were made in footwear destinations in the West that many Ghanaians boast of owning. Akusia should be proud of herself, 
But she tells me sometimes she regrets taking this path given that the system here in Ghana is crushing. The system will stifle you. The system is set up to, it's like, it's to make you fail. So if you, in truth, we have a word called reentance, or if you are not determined that I'm not going to fail, or even though we fail every day, I'm not going to back out or end it or close down my business, as has happened to a lot of businesses in the past year, you close your shop one day and never come back. What exactly in the system is crushing businesses? The founder of footwear fashion brand, Nuisa Shoes, tells me more. I know for sure that in every tertiary institution, entrepreneurship has been thought as one of the subjects there. So government should as well create conducive environment for us to practicalize what we've been taught in school. Yes, Isn't I, that so? I mean, it's, 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 it's very clear that if you want people to be engaged in entrepreneurship and certain things should exist and you have a friend who is engaged in his or her own business, I equally do have a number of friends who are engaged in their own businesses. And if you speak to them, they tell you about issues about rent, mm -hmm. issues about yeah. cost of electricity. I think you did a story on that. Yes, I spoke yeah, to... Yeah, well, you spoke to some um, I spoke to, people who have um, completed yes. school and all that. Giddens, he, run, he runs yeah. Giddens Fashion now. Mm -hmm. He does shoes, does bags. And young guy doing very well. Uh, but, I mean, if you look at the amount he has to pay for rent, and uh, because he his market are uh, students in, in the tertiary, He's renting around the UPSA mm -hmm. area. And if you look at the amount he has to pay for rent, and there's somebody who is employing about two or three people in addition to him, if you take out those who work with him uh, at the production phase of it, and there are a lot more young people who are doing these things. And I think that one thing that we need to be clear in some of these entrepreneurship drives that we have in our tertiary institutions is also to open the eyes of the uh, student mm -hmm. to the challenges because then you get a lot of people who come out and then save the small amount of money that they can. And I think even this even eases pressure on uh, the unemployment rate in this country and also on government, that government is not expected to uh, employ every talk they can hire who graduates from the tertiary institution. The private institutions are doing their part and the government is also doing their part. But if there is a conducive environment that I'm able to set up my business, I'm able to do something that is going to generate some funds for me, I am also able to recruit, I'm also able to employ people, I think it helps. I mean, it, 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 it's very, it goes straight to the point. And the government that is on power came to yeah. power with the, with that the point with the, with the point that you're going yeah. to make the environment more conducive i mean six years down the line <laughs> if the environment is indeed conducive we will know the story tells it exactly so uh, a lot more people are out there hoping that well they'll set up their own businesses be their own bosses and the environment is what we all want that should be created for us so that these individuals can at least be breadwinners and also earn some money into, and put into their pockets. This is how we end today's edition of CNR Extra here on City TV. My name is Philip Nihilati. I did this with Hansen Ajimad. Many thanks for your time and enjoy the rest of your day.